It's Jackson Snyder Presents Time! Starring Bogdan G. Shrunkov, The Thinking Believer. I don't know about you, but I'm interested in ancient Rome because ancient Rome had so much to do with ancient Israel, especially in the time of the Messiah. And I found a very appropriate article on ancient origins that I want to share with you. It's called Diseases and Pandemics in Ancient Rome, and it's from Ancient Origins. I figure if these plagues plagued Rome, then they certainly were present in Israel as well. And since we are all suffering from lockdown, and everybody is wondering about COVID-19, let's look back and see what the Israelites may have had to deal with in the times that we're most interested in. This article is by Victor Labate. During antiquity, Rome was an international metropolis, a melting pot bustling with people from all four corners of the empire. The city had impressive marble sculptures towering over overcrowded buildings called insulae, and different dialects rang out in the streets, packed with people from various backgrounds. The Romans grasped the connection between hygiene and health. In fact, the word hygiene comes from the Greek hygeia, which means health. And they built a large number of public baths throughout the city in order to keep the population clean. Nevertheless, Diseases were quite prevalent in ancient Rome, and many suffered from various illnesses across the empire. Rome was struck with a number of pandemics, which lasted for years and killed millions. Hygiene and health go hand in hand, and the Romans understood the importance of keeping the population clean. They maintained public bathing for... I think I already read that. They maintained public bathing facilities and built magnificent aqueducts and water systems that carried water from faraway springs and mountains into cities and towns. It can be said that the ancient Romans were cleaner than many Europeans living centuries later. For example, in 18th century Europe, there was a prevailing belief that taking baths was exposing the pores of the skin to illnesses. As a result, Kings living in magnificent palaces would rarely bathe and use perfumes profusely to cover bad odors. Many Europeans and even kings had no proper access to bathrooms and would use chamber pots that were to be emptied outside on the streets. In contrast, public toilets or latrines were common in ancient Rome. Wealthy Romans even had their own private baths, and they would spend much leisure time in these baths, conversing with other upper class Ro- with other upper class Romans, relaxing or even conducting business. It must be noted that even though many plebeians would regularly use the public baths, the standards of cleanliness were much lower than the standards in that are accepted today. For example. The heated water was not disinfected with chlorine as it is today, and bacteria thrived in the pools, oft times causing illness. Yet, this is a better trade-off than having people never bathing themselves. The complete absence of hygiene could lead to fatal diseases and generate viruses that could spread and kill large numbers of people. Even though there were laws that required cities to remove waste from the streets, Rome was far from a clean city. For example, during heavy rainstorms, the sewer system would overflow with human waste. Furthermore, not everybody was using the latrines and household excrement was often thrown onto the streets where it mixed with the dung of animals. Therefore, Rome was not a sparkly clean city and the conditions were certainly not ideal for preventing the spread of diseases. Well, there goes Augustine's city of God into the toilet. Living conditions in ancient Rome were far from comfortable. Life expectancy in the first century Rome was 22 years old, noting, however, that this figure included the high mortality rate of infants. I believe in Israel at the same time, according to surveys of burial grounds, The life expectancy was a little better, 29. The average height of an ancient Roman was 5 feet 2. As a case in point, the analysis of the skeleton of a middle-aged man in Herculeanum showed that he was undernourished, overworked, had rotting teeth, and suffered from 
disc displacement in disc displacement in the backbone. The Roman diet was not as rich as it is today, but it does not necessarily mean that it was less healthy. Furthermore, the Romans knew the importance of not overeating and promoting moderation for healthy living. The Romans ate large amounts of grain, fruits and vegetables, and consumed very little meat. Meat was actually very expensive, and only the wealthy could afford it. Interestingly, many vegetables and fruits that are associated with Mediterranean cuisine, such as tomatoes, eggplant, or lemons, did not exist in ancient Rome. The poorest Romans, who couldn't afford their food, were granted monthly rations of grain that they would use to make bread or pulse, a pottage made from farro grains boiled in water flavored with salt. As a result, Many Romans had multiple vitamin deficiency and suffered from malnutrition. Furthermore, the food was not monitored by an agency such as the Food and Drug Administration. So, Romans were often exposed to food poisoning due to contamination with parasites and microbes. The presence of parasites in the food was exacerbated by the use of human feces as fertilizer, which exposed the produce to human pathogens. Aqueducts supplied water to the Romans living in the cities, but the quality of water could vary. Some aqueducts were known to supply excellent quality water, while others were prone to muddy water, especially after a heavy rain, or they could contain debris if they were not well maintained. Many of the water pipes were made of lead, and as a result, many Romans suffered from lead poisoning. And that's my hypothesis about why. Roman emperors were so crazy. Lead poisoning. A study by Dr. Aufderheid of the University of Minnesota revealed that Romans had ten times more lead in their bones than modern Americans. The Romans knew about lead poisoning, hence ceramic and stone were often preferred over lead to manufacture the pipes transporting water. Nevertheless, many Romans, and according to some historians, even Emperor Caligula, see what I told you, suffered from lead poisoning. Many Romans drunk water directly from the rivers, especially in small towns and villages. It was possible to become sick from the water, and especially water from the Tiber River in Rome that contained bacteria. I read a lot and listen to a lot of stories about Roman legions out in the field. And the legions kind of moved from waterhole to waterhole. And several of the accounts talk about the Roman soldiers going right down to a river and drinking. Now, I just wonder why we can't drink water out of the stream today. But now I suppose that was one of the problems in the camp. Dysentery. Especially since they lived in tents and didn't bathe. Most Romans worked hard, woke up early, and went to bed early. They often lived in close quarters in crammed apartments, as living space was very limited. Housing had an impact on health, and the Romans infected each other in such confined quarters and spread the diseases. Urbanization also contributed to deforestation, which became extensive throughout Europe during the Roman Empire. Deforestation led to rising water table, and the development of marshes where larvae, bugs, and mosquitoes, all potential carriers of disease, thrive. A number of common diseases were prevalent in ancient Rome. Many Romans, especially poor Romans, had problems with their teeth. The Romans knew about the importance of brushing teeth, and the upper class appreciated white teeth. Aulus Cornelius Celsus, 25 BC to 50 AD, wrote in De Medicina, that food leftovers caused a disease called caries dentium. Roman aristocrats, Roman aristocrats brushed their teeth daily and had slaves to do the brushing for them, using a soft twig onto which various polishing powders, such as charcoal, were applied. Many Romans, however, suffered from tooth decay and gum disease. One reason was that their bread often contained grain that wore on people's teeth and increased bacterial growth. I've also read that in the grains, when they were crushed, a lot of stone got in there, and so they would often break and crack their teeth from that. Gee, I would like to go to a dentist someday. But in our culture, dental care is extraordinarily expensive. So we learn how to pierce abscesses 
right through the gum. Malaria was a common disease in ancient Rome, as it was transmitted by mosquitoes present in the marshes surrounding the cities. According to DNA analysis of the bones of ancient Romans, many people died from malaria. Tuberculosis, which has long been called the silent killer, was another common disease in the ancient world. The Greek called it phthisis, that would be phthisis, P-H-T-H-I-S-I-S, which describes a feeling of intense heat as if being burned by a flame. Some toothaches I've had, I'd rather walk in the flame. Brucellosis was another disease prevalent in ancient Rome. Brucellosis is a chronic respiratory disease that is usually contracted from contaminated meat or dairy products. It usually starts with a fever, sweating, body aches, and joint pain, and can end with organ failure. The disease still affects hundreds of thousands of people on a global scale today. The Greeks and Romans recognized cancer, but had little understanding of it. Hippocrates, who lived in the 5th and 4th centuries BC, described cancer or carcinos having a range of tumors and swellings that could spread to other parts of the body. Cancer was probably not as common as it is today as the Romans had a more natural diet and were not exposed to all the pollution and chemicals that contribute to this terrible disease in the modern world. Syphilis is a sexually transmitted disease that was prevalent in ancient Rome with terrible symptoms. I actually just last night I was listening to a Roman Empire uh, YouTube and one of the nobles' wives name, one of the noble's wife's name was Syphilis. And if you know what I mean, she was known as a rather prolific. Palladius, in Losaic history, writes about Heron, a young monk of Scetis, who visited a prostitute in Alexandria, Egypt. Palladius writes, and I quote, And when he was resolving to sin, he met an actress and had converse with her. In consequence, a carbuncle developed in his private parts, and for six months he was so ill that the parts rotted away and fell off. Uh, we've heard the same thing about King Herod. Maybe that was his problem. The Antonine Plague, 165 to 180 AD, was an ancient pandemic brought to the Roman Empire by soldiers returning from campaigns in the Near East. That would be somewhere around modern-day Iraq. It's called the Plague of Galen, from the name of the Greek physician who provided a detailed description of the disease. Galen, in the treatise Methodus Methodus Medendi, Methodus Medendi, describes the plague as lasting for a long time and affecting a large amount of people. According to Galen, the terrifying symptoms were at the onset of fever, a sore throat, diarrhea, and by the ninth day, postular psoriasis or blisters of pus surrounded by red skin. Modern scholars generally diagnose the disease as smallpox. According to the historian Dio Cassius, 155-235 AD, the Antonine Plague caused up to 2,000 deaths a day in Rome, and had a mortality rate of 25%. The plague spread throughout the Roman Empire and may have even received and may have even reached China in 166 AD. It most probably killed Roman Emperor Lucius Verus and an estimated 5 million people throughout the empire. Moreover, it is said that the Antonine Plague fueled the growing popularity of Christianity. The Plague of Cyprian, 249 to 262, was named after St. Cyprian, Bishop of Carthage, an early Christian writer who witnessed and described the plague in De Mortalitate. I'm sorry, De Mortalitate. Mortalitate. My Latin is so rusty. The symptoms of the disease were diarrhea, constant vomiting, red eyes, decaying feet or limbs, limping, and gradually loss of sight and hearing. At the height of the outbreak, from 250 to 262 AD, 5,000 people a day were reportedly dying from the disease in Rome. I must say that that is quite interesting. Do you concur? I concur. I concur. 
Uh, I concur. I concur. I concur. Concur. I concur. Affirmative. Keep this under your hat until an announcement is made. The plague was so severe that it wreaked havoc in the army and created labor shortages affecting food production. No one knows for sure what the disease was, but culprits include smallpox, pandemic influenza such as swine flu, or filovirus such as the Ebola virus. Don't you wonder what the doctors of that time did to help Well, I was going to say help cure these diseases, but I guess they really didn't. Then there's the Roman plague. Mainly affected the city of Rome in 590 AD. The plague killed a large number of people with many dying short, with many dying shortly after contracting the disease. Interestingly enough, the custom of saying, God bless you, Gesundheit, to someone who sneezes came about at this time, as sneezing was one of the signs that someone had contracted the disease, that is the Roman plague. Ancient Roman medicine was greatly influenced by ancient Greek medicine, which was fully adopted in the 2nd century BC, and there were a number of famous Greek physicians such as Galen, Dioscorides, and Soranus passing on their knowledge in Rome. And I might say, I have studied these doctors, and I think I even did a podcast on uh, it called, the study was called, ah, Pornea. Pornea comes from a book by the same title about Roman doctors. Look it up, it's a good book. Roman medicine contained many branches and the Romans practiced surgery and used surgical instruments such as forceps, tweezers, scalpels, scalpels, and catheters, not to mention razor blades. Medicine was particularly important for the Roman army, as being able to care for the wounded gave the army an advantage on the battlefield. The Roman army had permanent physicians in military hospitals, where surgery was extensively practiced. Actually, a number of medical advances were made by Roman army physicians, which benefited the entire population. Like maybe chopping off a leg with an axe that you just killed somebody with? And here's a picture in this article of these old Roman surgical instruments. Hey, you don't even want to see them. There were two types of physicians in ancient Rome, those in the private sector and those in the public sector. Wealthy Roman households had their own private doctors among their staff members. The wealthier Romans acquired doctors with the best reputations, which were usually Greek doctors. For example, Galen was the personal physician of several emperors, including Emperor Commodus, <laughs> while Orobasius was the physician to Emperor Julian. Public Roman doctors were not as highly regarded as private doctors because the majority of them were illiterate and would claim to have healing powers, often scamming the poor and the needy. Hey, like Simon Magus. In ancient Rome, there were no medical schools or official licensing and regulatory boards in order to become a physician. Everything was based on one's reputation and healing rate. There were some public doctors who did a decent job and provided effective treatments. Some good doctors would sometimes open up their practices, hire assistants, and charge a price for their treatments. But it can be said that even though doctors were available, overall, poor Romans had little access to good doctors and resorted mostly to prayer or rituals to heal their wounds. Thank goodness we still have prayers and rituals. Sometimes they work. The Romans applied a number of herbal remedies and other medicines to cure a number of illnesses. For example, the medication called Gentiani was made from a plant called Gentiana. It was used to treat poisonous bites, liver disorders, deep ulcers, and eye inflammation. Autumn crocus, which contains morphine and col colchicine, morphine and colchicine was used to treat gout and other diseases. It's got morphine in it. Must be kratom. The herbal medicine Ra was made from the rhubarb plant and was used to treat asthma, skeletal disorders, dysentery, internal disorders affecting the liver, stomach, spleen, and kidneys. Somebody saved me a piece of rhubarb pie the other night at my mother's. Aloe, still extensively used today, was used to heal wounds and treat 
alopecia. I think there's a skin disorder. The Romans had insight into the concept of contagion and even practiced quarantine. They also understood the importance of improving sanitation in order to spread, in order to curb the spread of contagious diseases. There were even laws restricting or banning people traveling from certain regions from entering Rome. Sound familiar? For example, following one of history's most devastating epidemics, Emperor Justinian enacted a law which was meant to ban or isolate people coming from plague-infested regions. Nowadays, we don't do that. We just isolate everybody in the world. So people lose their jobs. So people go crazy inside. So somebody benefits somewhere. But I don't know any of those people. Diseases were a fact of life in ancient Rome. A large number of people, especially the poor, suffered from various illnesses ranging from dental diseases to tuberculosis. The best doctors were only available to the wealthiest Ro- the best doctors were only available to the wealthiest Romans and many ordinary Romans had to endure their illnesses for the duration of their lives. Nevertheless, the Romans lived a healthier life than most people of their era. They bathed themselves regularly by visiting the baths, had access to water thanks to the aqueducts which provided abundant water to the cities, and could obtain health care from the best doctors of their time, if they could afford it. They might remember also in Jerusalem, Pilate took all the money out of the temple treasury and put it into aqueducts to bring water into the city, and that was probably a pretty good idea, because that probably solved some of the health problems in Jerusalem that would have been matched in Rome. And besides, in modern times now, we've learned to take out a diseased tooth with, a, with an ice skate. That ends the article. That was a good article. I'm going to just put a comment here and tell him so. And I wrote, I'm a Roman Legions fan. I am. I listen to Roman Legions and Roman audiobooks, fiction mainly, but also the historians, Tacitus, Diocasius, Diocasius, and uh, I can't think of an O, oh, Suetonius. I listen to those at night when I'm laying down trying to sleep. Man, I think that's interesting. And this article really adds a lot to it. And what I've asked the author is to write another article on the same subject, only switch to Jerusalem, Jerusalem, in about the same time period. That would be really good, too. Maybe they already have one. I'll take a look. You have been listening to Jackson Snyder Presents on Hebrew Nation Radio.